Podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories. But do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. It was my choice this week, and I have brought us The Firing Squad, another episode of The Witch's Tale. The groundbreaking series ran from May 21st, 1931 to June 13th, 1938 was created by St. Paul native Alonzo Dean Cole, who also wrote and directed the show. The series featured the first radio horror host, Old Nancy the Witch of Salem, who would introduce each story. Veteran actress Elidade Fitzallen provided the voice of Old Nancy until she passed away in 1935 at the age of 79. When Cole auditioned actresses to replace Fitzallen, only one person could capture the voice. 13-year-old Miriam Wolf, who provided Nancy's voice until the series ended in the summer of 1938. Occasionally, episodes of The Witch's Tale were told in two parts. This was usually unintentional. The show was performed live and intended to be 30 minutes long. If it ran long, Cole would turn the script into the first half of two parts on the fly during the performance. He would frantically write new pages and pass the new material to actors during the show. Cole would then take the opportunity to later rewrite the rest of the script to be next week's conclusion to the story. This recording of The Firing Squad was the third time The Witch's Tale presented the script. It was first performed August 31st, 1931, just 15 years after the end of World War I, during which the story is set. The script was presented a second time on August 21st, 1933. This recording was broadcast on January 20th, 1938, and it seems more connected to the near future than it does to the past. It was September of the following year that World War II would break out with Germany's invasion of Poland. So, with Miriam Wolf as old Nancy, and remember, she's only 13 years old, and Alonzo Dean Cole himself providing the voice of her cat, Satan, here is The Firing Squad from The Witch's Tale. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. The Witch's Tale. The fascination of the eerie. Weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting, waiting for you now. Seven year old I be today. Yes, sir. A hundred and seven year old. <laughs> well, Satan, we got a lot of yarn to spin these folks tonight. So if you'll give word to douse all lights, we'll get right smack down to business. That's right. Make it nice and dark and cheerful when you listen to our bedtime stories. <laughs> now Draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see a ruined village behind the western front in war-torn France in 1918. <laughs> and so begins our tale about the firing squad. <laughs> the firing squad! <laughs> Squad! Halt! Why do you make me look at this, Mac? Because that man's a traitor, Steve. But why should I watch him die? God. Blindfolded. Against a wall. Quiet. Don't let the men hear you. All right, Captain Mason. Proceed. God. Aim! Watch this execution. That's an order. Yes, sir. Squad! Quiet! He's dead. 
They shot him. Right shoulder! Up! He sold his people. He's received his pay. Squad, left! Forward! Up! But they shoot him down in cold blood. I don't care what that man did. Ah, oh, but I've seen butchery enough. I can't look at any more death. I can't look at any more death. Lieutenant Buckley, you forget yourself. I... Yeah. A good soldier must have no emotions. Merely a blind obedience. I hasten to apologize, Captain. Before you prefer charges that may stand me before a firing squad. Let's take a little walk, boy. I want to talk to you. Very well, sir. The command of my superior officer is law. Steve, an extra bar on my shoulders hasn't made any difference between us. You know that. In blood relationship, we may be only cousins. But I've always looked upon you as a younger brother. You're in trouble, kid. I want to help you. You've helped me enough already. By bringing me to France when I might have stayed at home. And when you get me here, instead of leaving me in Paris, you took me into below wood. Steve, you're not really a coward. I didn't realize it was going to be so hard. I thought this war would bring out your stronger side. You have a stronger side, if I could only find it. <laughs> ah, your nerves are gone. That's the whole trouble with you. You need a change, a rest. A few days in Paris. What are you driving at? Kid, you can go to Paris. In my pocket is a pass in your name. A, a pass? A pass for Paris? Mike, you're not kidding. You're not... Here it is. A pass to Paris? Oh, to a clean bed and sheets. To a bath. To women who wear white dresses and smell of perfume. <laughs> Why, you're a new man already. Oh, when can I leave? Tonight. Oh, thanks, uh, Mike, thanks. But before you thank me, there's a condition attached to this pass, Steve. Why, what do you mean? When you were in Paris before, you felt pretty hard for that Coudray woman. Steve, you mustn't see her again. Oh, Vera's not a plaster saint. I know that. I have no interest in her morals. Kid, this is in confidence. Vera Coudray is under strong suspicion of being a German spy. <laughs> oh, Lord. I know you've received another letter from Uncle Charles. He believes there's a spy hiding behind each blade of grass. Uncle Charles is in a position to have reason for such belief. Yeah, but why pick on Vera? If she were a German agent, how has she gotten away with it in Paris for four long years? Because Mademoiselle Coudray is very clever. So clever that others are caught and punished in her place. Ah, oh, that's ridiculous. No, Steve. The man you just saw die was one of that woman's lovers. I don't believe that. Letters were found on him proving it. Unfortunately, they didn't connect her with his act of treason. And as you saw, he went to his death in silence. It may be purely coincidence, but four other soldiers who are intimates of that woman have faced a firing squad for similar crimes. Four others? Yes. Three French and one English. This poor devil was the first American. All acted very strangely during their courts martial. None of them seemed to comprehend or realize the thing they'd done. Their minds appeared to be in a sort of haze. Crazy as it may sound... I believe that woman has some power that enslaves men's brains. You must promise you'll never see her again. I see now why you made me watch this execution. I've admitted to you I'm no patriotic hero, so you think me a possible traitor. That man's death was to be my object lesson. Oh, don't be a fool. I don't think anything of the kind. I did make you watch only to show you the sort of woman you're in love with. You haven't shown me anything. You've merely talked a lot of rot. And the moment I get to Paris, I'm going to call her up. No, you're not. Give me that pass. Mac! Your superior officer is speaking now. Give me that pass. No, you can't. You won't. I've got to get away, Mac. If I have to listen to those guns another day, I'll go crazy. I've got to get away. Give me that pass. No, no. Oh, for three days in Paris, I'll promise anything. I promise, Mac. Don't take it away from me. Swear you'll not see Vera Cordray. That you won't even telephone her. That if you meet her by accident, you won't speak to her. Swear it on your word of honor. I... Uh... On your word of honor. I swear on my word of honor. Uh, thanks, Steve. Ah, oh, don't be sore at me for this. You know I'm only trying to help you out of a possible trouble. I've done that ever since we were kids. It's become sort of second nature. Here. You pack now and be on your way. A good spree will put those jumpy nerves of yours to sleep. And when you come back, we'll go up there and do our job together. Yeah. Up there where those guns are booming. Up there where death is waiting. But I have three days now to live. <laughs> three days to live in Paris. Three days 
to live. <laughs> Three days delivering powers. Oh, what's the word of honor matter when you got to go back and die? That's what I figured, Vera. So I telephoned you to meet me in this cafe. <laughs> I do not understand, Mon Lieutenant. Why should you not have telephoned me? And why do you speak of words of honor? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> it's a personal private joke. <laughs> I'll teach old Mac to try and run my life. And if you only knew the silly reason he gave for one me to promise it. <laughs> I, I do not comprehend your little joke, but I will laugh with you. I will pour another glass of wine. Then perhaps you will tell me all about it. Yeah, pour me another glass. Hey, Vera, you only had one drink all the time we've been here. Don't you like this wine? I prefer to remain quite sober, as I can enjoy your happiness the more. And you are so happy, mon cher, to be away from the awful front. I, I'm so happy I could sing. Say, let's both sing, Vera. <laughs> wait, wait. Your glass is empty again. You will sing better when it is once more full. <laughs> I do my best. Drink, mon cher. Your company... You are what you call uh, division. <laughs> I am so ignorant of military terms. When you return, it will occupy the same place in the line as before? Oh, I don't know. Why are you all the time asking me questions about the front? Why you remind me i got to return? I want to forget that. I don't blame you. Oh, mon ami, would it not be wonderful if this wicked war was over? This war is never going to be over. It's going to last forever. I'm going to be killed. You mustn't think such things. Why, if Paris were taken, the war would be over in one week. What do you mean? Oh, the Bosch are only 70 kilometers away. If they should break through where your so brave American troops hold the line, this war would have to end. Yeah, they won't break through. No, I suppose not. Here, mon cher, you must have one more little drink. All oh, right. Thanks, Vera. Your uncle, the Major General... What does he say about this dangerous situation? You have told me he write letters to your cousin and tells him things when he sees him. Your cousin tells you about these letters, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mac tells me, look out for spies. <laughs> Everybody's a spy. You're a spy. I? Yeah. He made me promise not to see you. <laughs> now I told you, Vera, we can laugh together. <laughs> And he said you had strange powers that enslaves men's brains. <laughs> Why aren't you laughing, Vera? Why are you looking at me like that? So steady. So Look at me. Sure. I like to look at you. I'm crazy about you, Vera. You know, you've got the most wonderful eyes. Look into them deep. All right. Your eyes are awful wonderful, Vera. I, I feel so funny. Your eyes make me feel funny. They make me... Gaze into them. Do not try to look away. You cannot. No, I cannot. You are very much in love with me. Yes. You trust me absolutely. Yes. You are afraid of death. You wish this war to end. Yes, yes. And you believe that I can show you how to end it? I... You believe that I can show you how to end it? Yes. And you will do anything I tell you to bring it end about? Say, I will do anything you tell me to bring it end about? I... I... Do... Say, I will do anything... I will do anything you tell me to bring it end about. Now, let your waking mind remember that and forget that I have made you so remember. Mon ami, wake up, wake up. Huh? Is this the proper way to entertain a lady? I, I fell asleep. You I... were what you call dead to the world. Come, let us leave this stuffy place and walk to my apartment. It is pleasant there, and we will talk. Yeah, yeah, just, just you and me, Vera. Oh, I'm crazy about you. I've only three days to live. Then i got to go back there and die. Oh, no, mon cher. You will live to see this war all ended. It's funny, Vera. But, you know, the idea just come to my mind that maybe you and me could end it. Lieutenant Steve will be here at any moment. 
You are sure we've run no risk? Have I ever led us into danger? No. Your hypnotic powers have been of great value to the fatherland, mademoiselle. In three days, I have made this lieutenant my slave. And his uncle is a major general. If he is like his nephew, Germany does not need our help to win the war. Now listen, his leave is up. Tonight he returns to his company. No matter what happens, he will obey my will. Talk plainly to him and have no fear. I rely upon you. Hush. You wanted me, Vera? Yes, mon petit, come in. The gentleman of whom I spoke is here to see you. Monsieur Chabonneau, I present Lieutenant Buckley. I am charmed, Lieutenant. Monsieur Chabonneau. Of course I know that's not your real name. Mademoiselle Coudre has told me of your conversations. She told me how to end the war. It doesn't matter who wins, just so it's over, she says. She is right. And once the line is pierced between Soissons and Reims, Paris will be occupied within a week. The war will be over, and men will cease to die. Yeah. What am I to do to save my life and that of others? General Lutendorf wishes to learn the weakest spot in the line. Well, how can I find it? One who looks may see much. And to the nephew of a major general, things may be told. It, well, it doesn't seem right. Look into my eyes, mon cher. Because you wish to live, you will do as you are told. Yes, I'm going to live. For you. You will give the information we desire to a man wearing the uniform of a common American soldier. He will have a bandage bound around his head and his arm will be carried in a sling. He will give you the password, Koblenz. This man will meet you a week from today. What if I am killed within the week? That, of course, would be a misfortune. Remember, you are not to fear, mon cher. Nothing can harm you, I have told you. No, nothing can harm me. Not even a firing squad. Of that I have forbidden you to think at all. To ensure your safety when the drive begins, Lieutenant, you will take this capsule. It will make you very ill. Ill enough to be sent to a hospital in the rear. Where nothing can harm me. Can I have two capsules? Monsieur worries about his cousin, Capitaine Mason. I have told you many times that he will also be safe. Yeah. Yeah, Mac will be safe too. You've told me. To make Mademoiselle's assurance more certain of fulfillment, here are two capsules. Mademoiselle will enlighten you concerning any further details. It may be dangerous for me to remain here longer. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Goodbye. Mademoiselle. Au revoir, Monsieur. I offered him my hand. He didn't take it. Oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Exactly what I tell you to. That and nothing more. Come there. Halt. Off you, guys. Fall out. Everybody in, Steve? Yeah. All in. Oh, my kid. Trouble's over now for a while. Get out of the lines again. Tonight, for a change, we sleep in safety. Yeah. Safety. No! Easy, boy, easy. That one fell 300 yards away. But maybe not the next one. Maybe. No. No, nothing can harm me. Nothing can harm me. Here, don't let your nerves get you again. You've been a different man since you came back from Paris. Stay that way. Lord, what a Brannigan you must have had there, though. I've been in a sort of daze ever since. I'm all right. And I've been different this time in because I know nothing can harm me. Nor you either, Mac. And because I know the war is going to end. Sure. We'll be out of the trenches by Christmas. Huh. Some Christmas. Say, is that one of our men coming down the road? There's a bandage around his head and an arm in a sling. Bandage on his head? Arm in a sling? Yeah. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. Here, grab yourself 40 winks, kid. I'll see you later. No. No, I've got you. I've... Sergeant! Sergeant Potter! Yes, if Captain Mason comes back looking for me, I'll be up the road. Up there with that man whose head is bandaged. Yes, Lieutenant. The war will soon be over, Sergeant. The war will soon be over! This man can explain most of it. I memorized everything carefully, just as she told me. It is all very clear. The weakest point, you see, is just behind Thormans. Yeah. 
Yeah, just behind doormans. All is in readiness. The blow will be hard. And the war will be over. It'll be finished, as she said. I must hurry away now. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Goodbye. I... I... Oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Oh, down, Buckley. Buckley. Steve. Uh, come in. Steve. Steve, I've been looking everywhere for you. Bad news, kid. We have to go back. Back? Back where? The lines. What is just kind of man that I arrest orders. They need us to plug a weak spot. Back of Dormans. Considerable hike. Back of Dormans? What's the matter? Get that man with the bandaged head. Don't let him get away. No. I don't pay any attention to me. She told me. What are you talking about? Nothing. It's all right. Nothing can harm us. See to the men, Sergeant. Get ready to march. Yes, sir. Come in. Quiet. All right, you bugs. Come on. Get your pack. I, I can't find the capsules. I can't find the capsules. But nothing can harm us. Even back of Dormans. Oh, quit acting like a lunatic, Steve. We're going back of Dormans. Dormans! But nothing can harm us. Nothing can harm us. Nothing can harm us. <laughs> Steve. He got him. He's hit. Hey, get that doctor. A stretcher. Stretcher. He's coming with blood. And I'm responsible. I didn't look after him. I brought him into this. Steve. Don't die, kid. Don't die. Don't die. Shall get Luton back in heaven? Oh, thank God you're here, Doc. Quick. Oh, don't let him die. Don't let him. Doc. He isn't already. No, he isn't dead. He isn't going to die. Shell fragment grazed his head and knocked him cold. Plenty of blood, but just a flesh wound. Oh, thank God. Mark. Yeah, he's coming to already. Yeah, lucky guy. He won't have to go with us. He's got a ticket to the hospital. Mac. Mac, where are you, Mac? Uh, here, kid. Here. Uh, you're all right now. Well, that's part of you, Mr. Barris. What are they doing? Oh, my, where are they going to take me? To a hospital, kid. We'll have to go ahead without you. But where are you going? Why? Oh, you're going back up Dormans. And she lied when she said nothing could harm us. She lied. She lied. He's raving, Doc. Don't go back up Dormans, Mac. Don't go back up Dormans. Give him a shot, Doc. And quiet him down. No, 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 don't. I gotta leave you now, kid. No, Mac, listen. Let me tell you, Mac. Lieutenant Clark, take the rear company. Company, insurance. Mac. Rep, step forward, march. Mac, come back. Come back. Oh, he's gone. She lied and he'll be killed. I'll have killed him back in Dormer. <laughs> I didn't do us no favor when they brung that nutty lieutenant to this hospital. Uh, two idlers and a noise was sitting on his chest when I ducked out for a smoke just now. Gay things, if you ask me. Mm. Did you hear him carrying on? Claims his skipper standing by his bed with a big hole in his stomach. And that his outfit's been wiped out. All but 18 men. Yeah, I heard him. Cooper was a clock. Yeah, just the same. I'd hate to be imagining things like he is. Geez, an ambulance is coming. Come on, Sam. Maybe the driver's found a bottle somewhere. Yeah. Come on, you guys go on down. There's plenty there. What? Say, what's the matter? You got a car full there? Yeah, yeah, more coming. Big fight and make a dormant's way. Come on. Say, help me get these poor guys out of here, will you? All right. Just pull on the bottom first. Now, he... Oh. Hey, wait a minute. Well, I... Hey, dumbbell, you ambulance guy. You're talking Don't you know to me? better than to be hauling stiffs? What, one of them fellas croak on me? Say, look at him. Oh, no wonder with a hole in his stomach like that. Sam, he's got bars on his shoulder. The captain he was. Yeah, well, he ain't no longer. See if he's got his dog tag and help me with these other guys. Sam, wait a minute. His tag reads Captain Macklin Mason. That's who that crazy Louis says is standing by his bed. Gee, how did he know this guy was hitting the stomach 20 kilometers away? Even mon cher, all is forgotten now. You are out of the hospital, unarmed. The war is over. And you are with me. And you said, I remember, that nothing would harm us. Nothing did harm you. But you promised protection for him as well. He just looks at me and never speaks a word. But his eyes are telling me to come to the lines just back of Dorman. Stop! There is no one here beside you. Oh, why can't you see him when he's always here? You were his murderer as well as I. And he knows. See? He's turned. He's looking at you now. You make the cold run up and down my spine. I tell you that there is no one there. You'll see him one day. 
and the others. Eighteen left of the men I slept with. Marched with, fought with. Eighteen left. We killed the others. You're afraid to have him gaze at you? Oh, you say you cannot see him? You seem so sure, so certain. Yeah. I know the reason for his presence. His eyes are telling me to come to the lines just back at dormant. No, no, we are leaving France. But before we leave, we must go to the lines in back of dormant. Oh, this terrible idea of yours that had brought us to these muddy fields tonight. Since you had to come, why could we not wait till morning? I've told you, dear, Mac wanted it this way. He's spoken to me twice since we started from Paris. Not angry, as though he hated me for what I've done. Just kind. Just as he used to be. It's strange you haven't heard him speak. I have not heard for the same reason I have never seen. There is no one, nothing, there beside you. There has never been. I came here only to humor you and to keep you from talking to people who might believe the crazy things you say. We're walking where they fought the night when the Bosch broke through. At the place we told them was the weakest. They're walking over graves. The graves we made. Here they died, the men we killed. I cannot stand it. I will leave you. You can't leave. Nor can I. I knew we couldn't when I brought you here. What do you mean? That we have come to pay a debt. Where is that bugle? There are no soldiers here. Yes. Can't you see them? They're gathering all about us. I see nothing but shadows. Only shadows. Listen, the shadows are marching. Here comes our firing squad. Oh, you are not in sin. I see them coming towards us, and I see your capitan too. Let me get away. Oh, oh, I cannot move. We sold our people. Now we receive our pay. Oh, no, no, no. no. Already, Captain Mason. Proceed. Ah! Ready. No, no, no. Hey. No, 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 no. Oh. Give me back. Fire! It's all right, kid. Now I can look after you again. were found lying on the deserted battlefield. Two dead bodies of a woman and a man. On their chests were little blue marks, such as spent bullets might have made. Bullets that had come from too far away. Yes. Satan. You folks come see us next week when I has a birthday, and we'll have another cheerful yarn to spin ye. The Firing Squad from The Witch's Tale, here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was Tim's choice this week. This is the second Witch's Tale yes. uh, that we've delved into, but the one we did before was called... Um, the Devil, Devil Doctor. Doctor. Devil Doctor, yes. And we did that live on stage. Uh, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, it was nice to revisit The Witch's Tale. Uh, I have not delved back into any other Witch's Tale until Tim brought this to the table. So I was uh, really happy to do that. And I will start this by saying that from Devil Doctor and now this, I realized I need to listen to even more of these because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. The Witch's Tale historically was kind of at the forefront, not kind of, really was at the forefront of the first. Uh, radio horror. Was anybody doing it before, or were they the first? It's really the first in this familiar style, inventing the horror host, essentially, that now is so familiar, not just in old-time radio, but in comic books later, and in movies and television shows. I always think I've heard more witches' tale 
episodes than I have just because it is such a template for everything that comes afterwards. Right, that right. Yeah. You always feel like, oh, yeah, that old comfortable witch's tale. And I'm like, no, I haven't listened to many of those. It just feels like I have because so many people copied it. And I have to tell my daughter all the time if we watch any I Love Lucy, and she says, that's not funny or that's predictable or I've seen that before. Oh, yeah. I have to remind her, yeah, this is the first time anybody did anything like this. So, yes, it's be, the reason you're bored is because it's been copied a billion times, this style of comedy and these jokes. But imagine seeing this for the first time in, yeah. in this style. I have to put in a, a short little anecdote. I'm so sorry. But back when Mel Gibson's Hamlet was in theaters. <laughs> <laughs> I love the beginning. <laughs> I went to go see Mel Gibson's Hamlet in the theater. And I sat behind someone who, throughout most of the first part, they said... Alas, poor York, I knew him well. Alas, poor York. They said we were misquoting it. Alas, poor York, I knew him well. And they just repeated it over and over again. Um, so it was a little maddening. And then it got to the line, Alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio. And they felt like they'd nailed it. I'm like, you got it wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a really long anecdote. I'm sorry. But, no, we're good. Um, You'll get there. I'll get there. So we watched the movie, and it concludes. And this person in front of me who'd been talking to the whole thing at the end goes, It was all right, but it had so many cliches. <laughs> 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 Whenever I hear a story like that, that's, that's what I think of, of. This was the first time everybody else was copying this. <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be. Heard it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, why did you bring Witch's Tale back to us and why the Firing Squad? Witch's Tale, just because it has been so long. We haven't listened to as many as we think we have. Uh, it's such a groundbreaking series. Alonzo Dean Cole's a, a native son of Minnesota, so I felt attached to him, strangely. Um, <laughs> I just deliberately wanted to go dig back into Witch's Tale and find another one to bring. And I actually did have to do a little bit of digging. There were several that I felt like, this is just another version of Devil Doctor that's not as good. Mm. Uh, and then I found this one, which is radically different, that I was excited about. So that's really interesting that you say that, because I said just a minute ago, oh, I want to hear more of what you're still... Oh, I know. You, you might be disappointed. I, I would really dissuade you, but they like people popping up out of their coffins. <laughs> so far, you haven't dissuaded me. All right. <laughs> me you're going to like this series. <laughs> How much Bella Lugosi do they have? Not a wit. <laughs> This is a really interesting piece of horror for a lot of different reasons. And it's a lot different than Devil Doctor in, oh, yeah. in that sense of horror. It's real horrifying. It's a realistic, not supernatural. So that's an interesting it take. It takes so long for any supernatural element to be yeah. introduced that you really forget it's a possibility. Yeah, because it's already watching him just be afraid or listening to him be afraid and the emotions he's going through is disturbing in its own sense. Yeah, it opens with such an alarming scenario mm -hmm. to just start with Steve being forced to watch a traitor being shot by a firing squad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, like I said, it's real life mm -hmm. horror. And I, I don't know how much at the time they knew about trauma and PTSD or the World War One. I, I think they called it a thousand yard stare. Oh, yeah, yeah. But from our perspective, like we know this guy's hurting. From what we know now, he would have been taken out of there. Yeah, come on, guys. He this. just needed three days in Paris, <laughs> you big wimps. <laughs> Oh, let's give him a hug. No, he'll be fine. No. <laughs> um, uh, there is a suggestion as well that he's always been needing help or sensitive because uh, mm -hmm. his cousin, uh, Mac, yeah, makes oh, yeah. some suggestion like, I've taken care of you since you were young. So uh, yeah. not to disagree with the post-traumatic stress side of it, but if you take someone who already is very sensitive. I don't think it was suggested. I, I think it was very obvious that he had no business being in war. Like, yeah. He is not cut out for the front line duty. Well, who really is? But I guess there are those that perform yeah. better in that situation than others. And the usual cliche is the other way. Like if you have family members and relatives in high places, it means by modern storytelling standards, right. you get out of all the war. The, the yeah. story would be the opposite. If he had a you know an uncle who's a general and his cousin's a captain, that he wouldn't have to be on the front line. And it would be a story of some yeah, guy kind of using his nepotism to get out of fighting. The further you go back in war stories, the more uh, high profile people are, the more in the fray they were. You hear mm -hmm. about it all the time in Civil War stories, really guy is in charge of the troops i don't i mean i don't have anything specific but raises a sword and drives right into battle you know and yeah. that doesn't really happen anymore yeah. it, 
the more important you are, the more in the bunker you yeah, are. Yeah, it seems like his family here is trying to make a man out of him. Yeah. Here's an angle that I had on this that uh, I want to see if you guys felt. What year was this, Tim? Uh, 31? Uh, first done, yeah, 31. The one we're listening to, is this 38? Yes. So we're listening to the 1938 version. Yes. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Germany had, at this point, gone into Poland. No, not yet. Not 39 they went in? Yes. Okay. But still, the threat was starting to become obvious, do you think? I can't remember uh, I historically. I didn't really have time to nail down how much in America they would have been aware of what was coming. Right. What I'm getting at is this, is that I don't know if America at this point was saying, yeah, looks like we're heading down the barrel that we might end up involved in this. But then again, I think it really was Pearl Harbor that was the instigator like we're in. I mean, I think yeah, there was a that, lot of debate in this country before before that. Okay, you, so you can hear those in all those Arch Ober propaganda plays that he was fighting right. to rally the troops to participate in this fight. So getting to my point, it had an overtone of propaganda to it. Yeah, I don't know if that's us putting it on there, but it, I mean, it's a big coincidence if it, it is. It felt like, hey, buck up. It, there's a loose lips lecture in there, you know, to keep your mouth right. shut. See, and there's all funny. of these I, wartime things. I took it the exact opposite. Then in a couple more years, you would never have this sympathetic of a portrayal of someone who didn't want to fight. Once Pearl Harbor happens, this protagonist would be a sniveling awful coward. I think you're supposed to feel some sympathy for him. He right. really can't take this. And he is manipulated and then feels regret at the end in a human way, a human regret. And by the time we get into the propaganda area, I don't think we would be allowed this much sympathy for the character. That's I, probably I true. That. Although I do think the main lesson that came from this, his, his main failing was that he would rather see the war end than win. Right. That's what I'm getting. And that's, that's the thing he has to pay the price for. And also, Joshua, I get what you're saying about they wouldn't show a sympathetic character three years later like this unless they were using him to make a point Mm -hmm. about what happens if you don't, pardon the expression, man up. Mm -hmm. Look what's going to happen. So you better be strong because your country's counting on you. Oh, I totally agree with you that that's all there. I just think it's extra interesting because it falls in this this window of time in which – both, different, both those points of view are sitting at, side by side in this story. Different right. tone of the conversation yeah. historically than after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Let me jump to my favorite thing about this story. Mm-hmm. I think the most original part of the story is the very end when the ghost of his cousin comes to him and says, it's all right, kid, now I can look after you again. Right. And instead of it being this blood-curdling, yeah. avenging ghost that comes from the fog, yes, they die, but he, like, takes him away. There's this sort of compassion in his voice. And it just, A, it supports what I was saying about it being a somewhat compassionate uh, look at this character who is being branded as a coward. Um, mm-hmm. It's also just an original horror idea, a ghost that's back from the grave to kill him, but not purely out of vengeance. Yeah. Right. The plot itself. Here we go. It's time for uh, an Eric moment. <laughs> I got a little confused, and instead of going back, I thought, I'll just ask Tim live during the podcast. <laughs> what exactly happened? <laughs> I, the, there it's, is, a little it's a little goose, confusing. Lucy goosey there. Thank you. So it wasn't just me. So what do you mean, guy, where? <clears throat> I know that there's a woman he shouldn't talk to Mm -hmm. that can hypnotize men. She can enslave their brains. It's a little different. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And I know that he isn't supposed to talk to her, and this guy got shot for the same thing, and he ended up being a traitor, and you should watch this, and this is your warning. Now you can go to Paris, but don't see her. I get all that, and then he gets there, and he's like... Screw that. I'm going to drink, and I, I, I love you anyway because I'm under her spell. And there's the, or the spell of alcohol. Right. <laughs> What's the difference? Yeah. He ends up back at the line, and he needs to report to her where the weakness is. And then there's something about a guy with a head bandage on uh, 20 feet away. All right. <laughs> so the ins- mind is enslaved. Mm-hmm. Then he goes to meet her boss, Yes. I think, mm-hmm. who sets this up. Right. That he gives him two capsules that will make him and Mac so sick they can't continue to fight. Okay. And he sets up this meeting with the guy with the bandage to tell him where the weakest point is. Yes, Mm -hmm. in the line. uh, So we never actually get the conversation with the guy in the bandage. That's kind of off. All right. So that's where it feels like it's missing something. And that's where I went, wait, what? No, we we see the scene. He tells the guy with the bandage, and just as he's 
done telling the guy with the bandage, he finds out from Mac that his whole troop is being yes. sent to that yes. weak uh, spot. That is correct. So he's Sorry. not going to have time to use those capsules. He he's, lost the capsules, He yeah. can't find them in that moment, and they're all going to die. And he's screaming at the guy to come back before he goes to give this information to the enemy because he knows they're about to be attacked. And then he ends up getting hit by a piece of shrapnel, so he, gets out, he gets out of the fight, and everyone dies. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then the supernatural part. So they all die, and they all come back to life? That, that like seems zombies. to be the suggestion, yeah. or they're ghostly. They're I think, ghostly, I think yeah. they see shadowy figures, which suggests that Which freaks a out Hypno Lady. Yep. Okay. And, I, and thank you for telling me that it wasn't just me. It was, it was well, no. a little Sometimes difficult. Sometimes it's the audio quality of these early recordings combined with a- accents, and it can be really difficult to hear. I couldn't quite make out the very last line when there is a... He said, join us next week. Okay. No, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, when they, they find the bodies marked by little blue dots as if hit by spent bullets and the line sounds to me like bullets that came from too far away to pierce mm, was that the line that could be yeah, but it's a little muddled so it yeah. seemed to suggest that that you know again that ghostly retribution like yes. these bullets that came from the afterlife but still killed them you know all of that being said that you know i got a little tiny lost in there and then i got back in i was like okay i get it now i know what's going on it didn't affect my enjoyment at all. And I, yes, very easily could have gone back and listened and figured all that out. <laughs> but instead, I just wrote, ask Tim what happened <laughs> in that one part. So thank you for clearing that up for me. I thought the acting and the writing and the story was phenomenal. I thought it was really, really, really well done. Yeah, Witch's Tale has a reputation, certainly so, for big acting. And it's in this one, but I like it. It's very consistent throughout. Some of these shows, you'll have the one rogue actor who's totally doing <laughs> his own thing and everyone else is trying to do something else. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is really internally consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt for this guy. He seems so weak and so vulnerable that I even questioned the hypnotic powers of this woman. Because in most of the scenes, it just seemed like he was broken. I could have hypnotized was, that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's been drinking and he uh, thinks mm-hmm. he's in love and he instantly regrets his actions he has a real justification for it even in his muddled mind that we just end this war will save everyone's lives mm-hmm. um there's so, nice in that that drunken monologue that he starts out with the, oh, there's this thing i can't tell you talk 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 now i'm gonna tell you <laughs> yeah and his drunk acting was fun it was, it was <laughs> just enough over the top but not too over the top and i made the note because <clears throat> uh joshua and i uh outside of this podcast have had this conversation a lot uh and th- th- here we go <laughs> Joshua and I both play a drunk on stage very well. We both have this uh, skill set where we have gotten a lot of compliments for it. So I'm a little, (laughs) that's experience, but I'm critical. You can screw up playing drunk. Mm -hmm. And my note was, I thought he did really well. I think so too, because it's such a physical performance Mm -hmm. to be drunk and to Mm -hmm. channel it all through your voice. Yep. It has to be a little exaggerated because you don't have any of the body movement or physicality Mm -hmm. at all to sell it. It's that idea uh, that is lost on a lot of people. Being drunk means trying your best not to look drunk. (laughs) That's what we do. (laughs) And it provided a moment of dark comedy because it Mm -hmm. it is funny to hear him drunk, but you know something terrible is going to happen. As soon as it cuts to him, they're drunk. You're like, well, that's it. Hypno Lady's boss, was that a French accent? Was that a German French accent? What? Because it sounded like Bella Lugosi. <laughs> he had moments where he's like, you will go and take I this bill. I think they were both supposed to be French traders. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. that was a terrible French accent. Or, it sounded- or maybe he was German doing a bad French accent. Uh, there's well, deep layers there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Prepared That's, for this role for months. <laughs> <laughs> Table work was insane. <laughs> Vera, that was her name, not mm-hmm. Hypno Lady. <laughs> Vera, uh, I would like to see her uh, in an episode versus The Shadow, just staring at each other. No, you look into my eyes. <laughs> well, there actually is a Shadow episode very close to that. Is there? Uh, yeah. Uh, but we are working The Shadow into every single podcast we record <laughs> now. So. The, I think it's The Temple Bells of Nabon, I think. Wow. I you make could be wrong. Up. I could, and you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> I just go, hmm, yes, Nabon. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 It's called The Hypno Lady of Death. <laughs> uh, well, I did have to chuckle a little at the beginning when um, Mac is 
basically saying, I'm going to give you a three-day pass to <laughs> France. There's this woman who you're just uncontrollably attracted to. Just don't hang out with the sexy woman when you have three days off in Paris and everything right. will be fine. <laughs> Uh, could I go to another city then? <laughs> no. No? Paris. Paris. Okay, that's... Thanks. I also had to chuckle I uh, at the beginning. Now, we talked about Wolf, the uh, 13-year-old girl. What's her first name? Miriam. Miriam Wolf. 13-year-old girl playing uh, the witch. Oh. Uh, and it's so good. It's it really unbelievable is. that yeah. she's 13, but she has a line at the top that uh, made me chuckle. She says, I won't do her impression of her. The firing squad. The firing squad. She <laughs> says it twice and then goes, ah. You know, and I get it. She's a witch. She's laughing. But sometimes when people do witches laughing and it's like, what? what's so funny? What you, <laughs> why is that so funny? But she repeated it and I went, all right, we got it. It's the firing squad. And it's I wish hilarious. I could keep track and make sense of in the witch's tale. Each time they start a show, she starts by, I be 108, whatever number yeah. she comes up with, years old today. So it's always her birthday, and her age does not progress in, by any sense. No, it's, she, she's younger, she's older, it goes all mm-hmm. up and down the scale. Yeah, that's awesome. So the canon's impossible to write. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, well, uh, I'll start some voting unless someone's got something really important to say. No, no. I really enjoyed this. I didn't bring this up, but the Foley at the top, the very distant shelling. Mm. very distant chilling like it felt like it was a mile and a half two miles away but you could barely hear it they might have something to do with quality of recording but it really worked well like they weren't quite on the front but they were in a war um the the foley in the bar uh in the restaurant mm-hmm. was really subtle and beautiful and i thought it was well performed i thought it was a great story i liked everything about it and i think it stands the test of time i don't have a lot of complaints or Anything that I can say that uh, I wouldn't recommend this to other people. I, I guess uh, I'm holding dearly to my uh, votes of classic <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. because we have to have something that we hand out to just those few <laughs> moments and episodes of things. So I won't go with classic, but I will say stands a test time and really well done, really fun. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. And in fact, it's proven itself, even in its own history, to have relevance well after it was first made. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it still has relevance today. Well, and it's interesting, right? War doesn't change, right? The yep. lessons of it and what it does and the effects of it, it's never been different. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely stands the test of time. And The Witch's Tale itself is a classic just because every single story I might like better by another horror series would not be a classic if it weren't for The Witch's Tale in general. And I think this is definitely one of the best episodes of The Witch's Tale I've heard so far, writing-wise, um, definitely stands the test of time. All right. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Tim, tell them some stuff. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. You'll find other episodes of this podcast, as well as information about our live shows. We do live shows, and you can get information about it at ghoulishdelights.com. Yes, and you can also go to Patreon and support us. And through that support... You can become a member of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society. There's all sorts of fun rewards on there, including a monthly members-only podcast, The Secrets of the Mysterious Old Radio. It's very different from this podcast. No, not really at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's You'll still never fun. know. <laughs> but it's only available to you who sign up for that. Yeah. Also, go write us a review on iTunes because we super like that as well. And they can buy uh, merchandise, oh, right? Yes. Yeah. So actually, I. Uh, at goldishlights.com, you'll find links to our Facebook page and our Instagram page. And mm-hmm. please check those out because we love interacting with people. Whatever you guys those are, are awesome. <laughs> uh, and also link to our Threadless page where you can get like a Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society cup or sweater or blanket. There's all kinds of awesome things. We've discussed a shower curtain, but we're holding off. So you, you email us if you desperately want a Mysterious Old Radio <laughs> Listening Society shower curtain. We're trying to figure out the exact placement of the word mysterious <laughs> in our see-through <laughs> shower. All right, who's got more information the- than we need, Eric? <laughs> uh, I believe Joshua is next. Yes, I have the next episode. And speaking of classic radio shows, we are revisiting Quiet Please for a story called Beezer's Cellar. Until then. Look out! And so begins our tale about the firing squad. <laughs> the firing squad. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>